Tonight we're going to travel back in time and look at one of my favorite games from one of my favorite players, the legendary mid-19th century world champion Paul Morphy. And I would say that Morphy was not only one of the greatest chess players of all time, but one of the greatest minds of our time, period. So here we go. Morphy is playing an amateur, and even if he's playing an amateur or professional, any level, Morphy was able to produce art in all of his games because he had the champion's mentality that there is no such thing as a casual game. So Morphy played e4, e5, and unleashed one of his favorites, the King's Gambit, one of the darlings of the romantic era of chess. White just throws caution to the wind, weakening his entire kingside. And his goal is after e takes f4 to take over the center, he could play d4. But he can't do that yet because then black can play queen h4 check, and then the white king would have to dance up to e2. However, that did not stop Kasparov from trying this in the recent rapid tournament in St. Louis versus Karyakin. And of course, after queen h4, king e2. He was very brave, but at the opening experiment did not work out too well for him. So, instead, after e takes f4, we have the king's gambit accepted. And Morphy played the solid knight f3, taking over the center, guarding the h4 square, developing quickly, threatening d4, and just taking over everything. And if he gets in d4, and then bishop takes f4, he has the entire center to himself. So that's the idea of the king's gambit. But of course, it's not so simple in practice, because black can play g5, guarding the pawn, taking over space, maybe threatening g4 in the future, and if this knight has to leave, then queen h4 check. And again, massive threats against the black king. But Morphy ignored that and played bishop to c4. The other move might be h4, but Morphy went for the more aggressive bishop to c4. And now here, a more solid continuation would just be bishop to g7, shoring up the black king side, then maybe playing h6 next. But black went for it and played g4. Attacking the knight, probably hoping for knight e5, and then queen h4 check. And then the king would have to don't go dancing again. But instead, after g4, Morphy ignored that, continuing to develop in his style, giving up not only a pawn, but now a piece, and just castled, giving a piece for seemingly nothing. But after g takes f3, queen takes f3, now black has a white has a tremendous lead in development. He is castled, he has his queen on f3, his bishop on c4. Now he's starting to play queen takes f4 in a very simple Queen takes f7 checkmate. So black has to address this, and the, and the attack is coming fast. So black plays queen to f6, and Morphy continues with e5, sacrificing another pawn. And queen takes e5. Now we have the Musial Gambit, very common gambit. Morphy knew it at the time, and even a player, an amateur such as Karl Marx, who was a, was a you know famous German philosopher, but he was also a fan of chess, and he had studied Morphy's games uh, for sure. And here, Marx, in one of his games, played d3, which is called the single Musio Gambit. But Morphew had none of that, and he went for the double Musio Gambit, played bishop takes f7 check. Crazy variation. And after king takes f7, you can see that black's king is totally exposed. But of course, black's up two pieces and some pawns, too. Morphy gives another pawn, d4, sacrificing again. Queen takes d4. And now, bishop e3, all a tempo. And if queen takes b2, then queen takes f4, knight f6, and bishop d4 would be totally crushing. So instead, after bishop to e3, black simply retreated, queen to f6, trying to block this f-file, shore it up. Morphy, of course, could just play the solid-looking bishop takes f4. Of course, nothing's too solid in this position. But instead, he played the beautiful knight to c3, developing all of his pieces quickly. Now you could see the rooks coming to e1. Knight might come to d5, queen f5, maybe g4, with this tremendous attack. So black tried f takes e3, taking a third piece. But now you can see that rook is on the line of the king and the queen. So Morphy quickly won the queen with queen h5 check. And after king to g7, rook takes f6, winning the queen. Knight takes f6. But of course now black has, you can count it, three pieces and a rook for the queen. But black's king is under incredible danger. Queen to g5, check. King f7. Morphy brings the last piece into the fire, never gives black a chance to organize himself. Rook to f1. And now, after bishop to e7, defending f6, Morphy brings the last piece into the attack. Knight to d5, working the pin. Black plays e2, threatening to make a queen. Morphy plays, of course, rook takes f6, and if bishop takes f6, you can do it in your head, queen takes f6, and if king to e8, 
either knight takes c7 checkmate or queen takes or queen to e7 and if king to g8 then knight to e7 mate i'll just show you that right now checkmate or checkmate and if king g8 knight to e7 So after rook takes f6, black tried king to e8. And now, can you find the best move? Of course, there are many ways for white to win here in this position. He might just play queen to e5, and after knight c6, maybe queen takes e2. But Morphy searched for the truth. He wasn't interested in the easiest way to win. He was interested in the most beautiful way to win, the most artistic way to win. And that's why we still study his games today. So, I'll give you a few seconds. Can you find the best move on the board? And black is threatening e1 equals queen. White must stop it. Morphe played the absolutely stunning rook to e6, double exclaim. Opening up the line for queen takes e7 mate. Stopping e1 equals queen and threatening checkmate everywhere. And so black resigned. That's all.